Hello, the computer rebooted. I think you might be back. Um, I, I hope you can hear us. Do let us know in the chat if you can see or hear us. That would be wonderful to know. Um, but good evening, everybody. Um, do give us a shout if this is working because it was clear, quite clearly didn't work. But it went live. It, it went off. live and we no pushed way. the button and having tested everything, the entire computer froze and restarted itself. So, yes, Cathy. Wonderful, Kathy's that here. is great there news. We are. Fantastic. <clears throat> is, it, is, is it worth doing the intro again? It's probably not. Anyway, welcome to Cheese and Wine Tasting uh, with the Online Wine Tasting Club. I'm Alex, this is Jamie. You probably know that already. If you don't, very warm welcome, because you're probably joining us for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. So tonight is a bit of fun. It's less so about a deep technical dive into each and every wine. It's about the, the good things, the good wine, the good cheese, the good stuff. Um, yeah. So, you know, we've sent some wines out. We sent a little list of cheeses on there. If you've got those cheeses, great. If you've got something different, let us know. And tonight, it's just about a bit of mix and match. You know, with the wines, we've gone with some general styles. You know, we've got not yeah. gone too weird and wonderful and funky or anything like that. Um, and it's just how cheese and wine have gone together for hundreds and hundreds of years and why they should. So I'm going to get wine number one into the glass. And Alex is just going to run That's through the fun. cheese yeah. board that <clears> we've got. Absolutely. So... What we just wanted to do is put together some cheeses that represented the kind of the general sort of categories that cheeses fall into. And what we've got here is we're starting with a, with a actually, well, we're not starting because we're going to talk about how the different wines pair with the different cheeses. So don't, don't kind of consume all of cheese one with wine number one. That's not the kind of plan. Do a bit of a mix and match and keep some back to see how it goes. But we've got a, a goat's cheese, which is this creamy, soft style of cheese, which is often quite subtle in flavour or can be a little bit more punchy. Um, but but it's that creaminess, which comes from a lot of sort of milk fat and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, hello to Stoke-on-Trent. Oh, sorry, Burton-on-Trent. I'm so oh, sorry. I can't read wrong. the small writing and then be in big it comes trouble. up and I see it. But hello. Um, so we've got a goat's cheese. Then we've got a brie. Which is brie. Well Everybody done. Everybody knows brie, don't well, they? So, well I mean, there's not much more to add to that. But, um, we have, we've got a, a very, very mature cheddar. We've gone for the Davis Snow cheddar. Um, and we've got a smoked cheese. We've got a cheese with some fruits in. And, of course, we've got a blue cheese, which, you know, we can talk about cheese and port. And I'm sure we've probably talked to most of you about cheese and port before. But that is the classic combination. So why not? Let's have a go. And then, me being me, I'd also got a bonus cheese because it was on the special offer in Waitrose. I've got a San Massimo. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we'll Ale Alex being is. Alex has also got some got charcuterie <laughs> and some olives and some yeah we do we've got some all bits we've got some so, Jacobs we've got some uh, charcoal and um, rye bread crackers sourdough we've got the rosemary and sea salt and just for Jamie because there's one thing I think lots of wines can be very divisive you know do we like Chardonnay don't we like Chardonnay but at least the one thing that we can all agree on is that Marmite is bloody brilliant. So I've got some Marmite and cheese crackers just for Jamie, who, of course, is a Marmite aficionado something like, like no others. Yes, yes, absolutely. And we've got pickles, we've got olives, we've got some mushrooms, we've got some peppers. We've got some cheese to go with our cheese, actually, as well. But that's just because it came with the sun-dried tomatoes and I didn't realise. But uh, let us know what you've got in your snack chat. Um, this is our dinner, so we will be munching a little bit. And if we're making too much noise, just shout us. Shut up, guys. Yeah, and we'll talk yeah, more talking, less eating. More talking, less eating. Exactly. But anyway, so let's let's talk a little bit wine number one. And <clears> we are over in California, in Arroyo Seco, in California. And this is J Law. Um, absolutely love this winery. They make lots and lots of cool, different things. Um, you know, a lot of the things that people do know, the Chardonnays, the Sauvignon Blancs, yep. the Merlots, that kind of thing. And then some kind of weird and wonderful. They make a little Valdigui and stuff like that. Yep. But this is their Flume Crossing Sauvignon Blanc from the Arroyo Seco. So the Rua Seco, by the name, is a <laughs> relatively dry place. It is. Um, well, and apart from right about now or for the last few months, California has obviously had droughts for quite a long time. But you can see that the, there is a river which goes through this region. And it's quite, it's really in the bottom left corner. It gets really quite steep and gorge-like. So um, as it comes out into the sort of the, the, the east side, you've got the range of mountains that goes down there. Um, and as you go into the Central Valley, it flattens out a bit, but it gives us like moderating influence, doesn't it, to the to, to the to the atmosphere when there's any river or any water in it, which there is quite a lot now. But you can sort of see Jay Law just sort of really in the slap bang in the centre of this, not far from the river at all. 
I'm sorry, while you're playing with picture <coughs> things, do you want to yeah. uh, get the slider reloaded the the uh, computer That's decided it wasn't going to play idea. anymore and people start popping their tasting notes in? That's an excellent So idea. for those who are joining us for the first time, you can go to slido.com, scan the little QR code there, and you can start popping your tasting notes in. Uh, for those who have joined us previously, you know the deal. Get the words yeah, in there. Let us know really. what you're tasting. So are you all right with that? Are you all good? Yeah, that's. It's thinking, <laughs> thinking about it. It's thinking. I'm not sure it's letting me control it, but I'm going to give it another poke to see what happens. Um, yeah. Oh, no, that's one, two. There we go. Oh, yeah. Right. Why not? What? That's next week's one. That's next week's one. <sighs> He'll be back momentarily. Sorry, guys. Right. IT. It's sent to try us, isn't it? It's your favourite. It's your favourite. There we go. Right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Oh. J-Law, so normal. That sounds a little bit more like it. So Absolutely. So while you get your tasting notes in there and mm -hmm. you have a little sip, um, we're going to taste through some of our cheeses. But we've got a little bit of a video because wine and cheese are yeah, what's really that all about? so different. They're not. There are lots of similarities in the way they're made, the way they've evolved over time. And, and so we thought we'd do a little bit of an explore into this. And hopefully when I push this video... The computer's not going to reboot again, but we'll give it a go and see you in a few minutes. Tuck into any of your wines, any of your cheeses, and we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Or not. No, I can't get that to work at the moment, so Jamie's going to talk about wine number one while I go off and sort that out. Okay. You just kick the plug out. Look at him. His shirt, his shirt was so bright, turned the lights off. So, yeah. So, while we're getting the uh, tasting notes into the chat, the joy of, you know, we sat here for three hours and got everything kind of set up. So, yeah. So, J-Law in Arroyo Seco. And for those who have been with us for a little while, there's an absolutely fantastic, um, it's a fantastic winery. Uh, we did a, a full-blown tasting with a guy called Steve Peck, who's the director of wine over there. Um, and for me, this, you know, it's, it's Central Coast wine. And California, it's, you know, the, the biggest winemaking part of, of the US, but it has so many different styles, so many different regions, so many different places. So it's absolutely fantastic place to get your wine from. And it used to be just, you know, what you would find in the UK. And it was a big, big bugbear of mine when I first moved back. It was either five quid cheap and cheerful off the supermarket shelf or 500 quid. And there was absolutely nothing in between. Um, and that was, you know, a huge, huge problem. There wasn't this kind of everyday drinking California wine unless it was from one of the mass, mass brands. So really exciting for this to be around and available. You're coming through again. He's coming back. Stop eating the cheese. Come on, mate. <laughs> <coughs> right. Sorry about that. We are back. Um... <clears throat> What is the Slido code? So if you go to towtc.co.uk slash taste, that should take you automatically there. We did do that, and we did check that, and it did all work. So, um, But yes, we've got some nice tasting notes coming in. So Sauvignon Blanc and cheese, obviously, we, we think of Sauvignon in, in the Loire Valley. Um, and, I, you know, it, it's funny. It's, it's, a, it's a complex wine. It's a very unique style of wine, and it has some unique chemicals in it. And what... <clears throat> For me, that makes it quite a tricky wine to pair with. Like, you know, pairing things like Bacchus can be quite tricky for the same sort of reasons. It's, it's got those those quite sort of standout flavours um, and aromas that, that don't necessarily lend themselves to being very easy to match. But so what, what do you think would be the sort of thing you would do with this one? So I think this this is that kind of classic. And I know we've gone to California with the <coughs> Um but it is that kind of what goes together grows together. Yeah. And you talk Sauvignon Blanc, you talk Loire Valley, you talk goat's cheese. And that's really kind of that classic pairing. You get that kind of that lemoniness, um, sometimes that little bit of almost like ammonia tanginess that you get from a goat's cheese. Okay. And then that goes really, really well with the acidity of your Sauvignon Blanc. So you've got this. Sorry, when this. you smell the cheese, is that a good idea? Yeah, absolutely. So when you're, you know, tasting cheese isn't very dissimilar to. Um, Tasting a wine, it's, you know, you have to do the whole kind of look at it. You want to look at, you know, the rind when you start. You know, some cheeses have um, non-organic rinds where they're plastic or they're wax. 
Some have organic rinds, um, which is kind of like either a, a mold that's bloomed, so you've got that bloomy rind, or they can be covered in other things. You know, there's vegetable ashes and yep. things like that that will will cover the cheese. So you want to have a look at your rind first, then you want to cut the, the the cheese open, yep. and then you want to look at the uh, the texture of what's called the paste on the inside. So you know, you have everything from really really soft and creamy, like you have in the goat's cheese, and then you can go all the way to really really hard, like a uh, like a Parmigiano Reggiano or something like that. Um, mm. So and then everywhere in between, and so you kind of have a look at that. And then you want to look at the flavor profile. You want to have a smell, and there's kind of your non-complex flavors. So the kind of, does it smell creamy? Does it smell yogurty? Does it smell bready? Does it smell all those kind yep. of things? And then you can have your more complex flavors you die is, is there Is it yeasty? Is it, you know, those kind of things. And, okay. go through there. and then very similar to one, you'll then taste and you'll, you'll look at, you know, the body, the mouthfeel. Is it heavy? Is it weighty? Yep. Is there acidity? Is there fattiness? And... There's a lot of considerations that are very, very similar to, um, you know, that you do when you taste a wine. And yeah. I think that's kind of important because a lot of time you do wine and cheese tastings and the cheese just gets stuck on the side. And you have a bit of cheese with a bit of wine and that's what it is. And people go, oh, I love cheese and wine. <clears throat> And it can be as simple as that if you want it to be, but it can also be much more complicated than that. You know, saying I like cheese and wine, well, what cheese, what wine? There's there's as many cheeses out there as there are wines, if, if not more, um, you know. And a goat's cheese from here is different from a goat's cheese from there, and a mild cheddar is different to a mature cheddar, and, you know, a guy who's using that kind of milk from there, and, you know, different cheeses from different animals, whether it's cow, goat, sheep, buffalo, whatever they're making. Course, You've got yeah. all these different well, and things. And of what they're eating as well, you know. <clears throat> but um, I, 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 I have to say I like this combination. I've, I've, I'm trying it on top of the rosemary cracker, and I think the, the herbiness really does actually work with that as well. And um, that's well, quite interesting because you've got a very herbaceous nature to the Sauvignon but, Blanc. As well. Yeah, and you look at that, you know, that characteristics when you talk about Sauvignon Blancs, you have that greenness, that grassiness, that herbaceousness. Um, but also you've got this lovely acidity where you've got that richness and that creaminess of the cheese that's going to kind of balance that. The what that you want that acidity in the wine because it almost acts like a squeegee on your tongue that you have that first sip and it just nice and yeah, fresh, nice yeah. and fresh, and you want to go back and have another bite, mm -hmm. have another taste, and go from there. And what do we got? We've got an Abergavenny soft goat's cheese. That's exciting. Oh, nice, very good. <clears throat> if we're talking about the acidity of a wine like this. Um, there's, as we mentioned, there's two different ways of measuring acidity, and there's the pH, which is what we all learnt in chemistry, and then there's this sort of total acidity, which is measured in the grams of sort of equivalent to acid it's got per litre of the wine, or in this case, per 100 millilitres it's giving us that. But this is coming out about, you know, sort of seven grams, and it's, um, it's, it's, that is a decent level of acidity, and that does make your mouth water and cuts through that creaminess really beautifully, so it's very nice. Um, we've got a first time live participant. Hello, Tristan. Well done on joining us live. We we'll look forward to hearing what you think about it. And uh, uh, yeah, very warmly welcome indeed. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, are you got any thoughts or you just eat? You're just, you're, thoughts, you're, I'm just, just snacking. Just no, no. snacking <laughs> so, should we, have, should we have a little look at the, the tasting notes before we, we head should, onto, yeah. the, uh, onto wine numero two? But yeah, you know. It's classic, you know, it's classic Sauvignon Blanc notes, you know, it's got the lime, it's got the lemon, <clears throat> it's got the smooth, it's got that freshness, it's got that citrus. And where it's sitting in California, because I, I talk about Sauvignon Blanc a lot about having its own typicity wherever it hangs out at. <coughs> you know, the Loire Valley a bit more grassy, New Zealand a bit more grapefruity, and then California has this slightly bit more mm. of that kind of stone fruit thing. We see a lot of peach, um, you know, there's Something apricot, more, that kind know. of stuff, so that little bit more riper those ripe fruits so yeah where it's cooler in the loire valley you get more of those grassy notes you know where it's warmer and more cut you know that coastal side of new zealand and that particular style of sauvignon blanc yeah. being machine harvested that gives you that kind of gooseberry grapefruity kind of style and then these guys do it's, it's what a very they do. different style no? it's it's very a really tasty style actually it's a it's nicely balanced if you look at the the vineyards here what you'll see is it is very dry soil on the whole. And, you know, the, the, the amount of precipitation that's going on in California at the moment is insane. I mean, um, but 
you can see what it's like in this type of year. You've got that those nice light stones that reflect the light and the heat. The vines have to struggle a bit to get their water, as you can see. The, you know, the eagle allied among you will spot a little pipe going along around the sort of the roots of the plant, and that is obviously for, for irrigating the so they can control, make sure the plants aren't going into a stress situation where where your vine doesn't get enough water, it stops being able to photosynthesize. It stops being able to turn that sunlight and the carbon dioxide into sugar, which is obviously what it's trying to do for the grapes. So so you've got to keep it keep it going. And for these guys heading towards the central valley of California, we're about sort of level with Monterey here. Um, that, that's been a really difficult challenge because the, the, the wells have been getting drier and drier. But this year they have got, um, we got a quite extraordinary photo from Bear Valley in California, um, which is up in the sort of Lake Tahoe area. You can see here the top of the, the, the pole that holds the ski lift to go up. That is how much snow there was. Uh, They've got 53 feet of it of chopped there. It's 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 quite unprecedented, and it's still more of it is coming. So, yeah, crazy times going on in um in California at the moment. But it's good news for the wine guys because a lot of these aquifers are getting refilled, the reservoirs are getting refilled. It's all great stuff for the for 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 helping keep the production sustainable, which is nice. That doesn't tell you anything at all about cheese, but but <clears throat> I think Sauvignon, cream cheese. Is there any other cheese that we should I should give a go with with this one? What do you think? So, well, you know, keep a little bit, you mm -hmm. know, and we'll go backwards and forwards. We'll work through okay. the cheese. We'll work through the wines. and Because um, I'm guessing, you know, at 20 past eight, people are probably quite yeah, thirsty. We should probably move on to wine number two. That's absolutely fair. And it is. <clears throat> right. So we are heading south. South. Wow. To Chile, and this is Chateau Los Boldos from the Cachapoal Valley. Uh, in Chile. So this is, for me, Chardonnay can be polarizing. So what I'm hoping I've done is I've tried to pick a relatively non-polarizing Chardonnay. So this is, there's no oak aging on it, but it does spend a little bit of time on the leaves. So it gives it that little bit of a richness without it being overly oaky and for me this kind of you know and once again your own opinion I love people's other opinions because food and wine is a very personal kind of thing of what you like and what you don't like and what you enjoy um so my thoughts on this is this is quite a versatile wine so it'd be quite versatile with a lot of cheeses and chardonnay in general is quite a versatile wine depending where it goes my pick with this would probably be the cheddar um, because you've got that little bit of richness, okay. that little bit of salinity would go there. If there was a little bit more oak on the Chardonnay, you'd be able to move more towards your smoked cheeses. Yeah. And if you were a little bit, you didn't have that lazy bit and you were going for that very kind of like stainless steel linear style of Chardonnay, that's when you could probably drop back into the brie. But that really depends where people feel this is in their personal oaky kind of world. Um, so there's, 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 um, there's oh. a side quest for tonight, which is to say, Jamie has set a challenge that the best cheese pun that goes in the chat that he hasn't heard before will win a bottle of wine from tonight. Your favourite bottle of wine from tonight's tasting. So get punning away. But be brief. Did you hear about the explosion in the cheese factory? There was debris everywhere. Okay. Well, he set the bar really high. So... Um... <laughs> That's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. Um, Kathy, skiing in Lake Tahoe is gorgeous, isn't it? It's just such a beautiful place to do. I, I've, I've been to Heavenly a few times, and the the, the name of it is very, uh, very well, well. To be uh, to, to be fair, there's there's a point being large cheese, mozzarella, mm -hmm. parmesan, and cheddar. You know, still three great cheeses to be mm -hmm. playing with. It's uh, you know, it's not dairily in an American cheese slice. <laughs> so you know, it's uh, Party cheese. It's okay. Mm. So. We're, we're, in, we're in Chile, and um, this is 170 hectares of vineyard here um, from Los Baldos, planted in 1948. Um, so we're about, you know, for, for geography's sake, we're about 100 kilometres south of Santiago. Mm. Um, so, you know, relatively warm, but <clears throat> yep. also, you know, Chile being a long, thin country, nothing is very far from the coast at all. Okay. Nothing is either very far from the coast or very far from the hills. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you're going to always get a cooling influence and an altitude influence, which enables to have, you know, long growing season, 
um, and able to be able to manipulate your wine to be the style that you want. If you want to leave it on the yeah. vines for longer, you've got a lot less chance of disease because you've got the wind coming through. Um, so you can leave it on for longer. And because it's a little bit warmer, you know, it can ripen, you know, you can pick it really mm. when you want it, depending if you want to keep the acidity very high or if you want to kind of let it run. And because they've got this, you know, big plot of land, they can pick some stuff early yep. to keep acidity. They can pick some stuff late, and then they blend it all together to create the style that they're looking for. As well, which is quite nice. Um, exactly. Yeah, so you know, we're talking about the richness. Does sell quite the safe route down the middle, doesn't it? Oh, but... it does. It does. Thirty percent mallow, three months yeah. on leaves. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Keep everybody happy. Shard makes all the masses. It works very nicely with the marmite crackers. In fact, I think you should. Oh, uh, the, the, the 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 mascarpone jokes <laughs> come in. <laughs> Very good. Well done. That's excellent. Um, best cheese to hide a horse. Excellent. Excellent. Um, but I guess there's still tons of jokes to come in. The, the, oh, dear me. <laughs> okay. So what have you tried with this? Because I'm talking and you're eating. It seems like you're my, my edible so side I've tried the cheddar. I've tried the cheddar <clears throat> on, the, on the Marmite thing which also oh mark rothwell for high points that is <coughs> that's good i like that oh my word very good very good indeed um but where would you say um sweetness fits in with with cheeses because we've got we've got a little one of these kind of you know fig like pastes and sweet fig paste kind of things and they're, they're always very nice with the cheese on their own but it kind of throws things a bit out of skew like with the with the wine i find so it's an interesting thing, and there there might be many there might be many people who murder me for saying this. When we talk about science, yep. wine and cheese not a particularly good match. <laughs> so because what you have, I know, I know, I know, but but it's absolutely delicious. But when you have a piece of cheese, generally, yeah, yeah, okay, you've got that fattiness, yeah. So take yeah. that piece of brick. Actually, before you I'm start, a take, take a sip of your chardonnay first. Right, chardonnay. take a sip of your chardonnay. Okay. Taste the freshness, taste the acidity, taste the green apple, yeah? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now put that cheese in your mouth. Okay. Swill it around a bit, yeah? Swallow the bit of cheese, but don't let your saliva hit your tongue. Now sip that again, while well, you've still got a bit of cheese in there. Okay. The green apple's gone, yeah? Mm-hmm. The freshness is gone. The Can you taste much? You can't no, really taste much, really can you? really masked it. Yeah. Yes. It's kind of blocked so, up your tongue. With is, the... it, is it delicious? Yes. Yeah, yes. But I was I was told by one of the first sommeliers I ever worked for, you should uh, buy wine with apples and sell wine with cheese. Yes. Um, because that fattiness, it's delicious, but it masks some of the flavours of the wine. Mm. And this is why you need a level of acidity that almost acts like that squeegee on your yeah. tongue, that refreshing. That then, So you have that taste, then that refreshingness happens, and you go, now I want another bite of cheese, don't you? I do, I do. Exactly. <laughs> so that's kind so of what I it do is. I do quite so, fancy another night without, so, without free. Scientifically, yeah, it's not a great pairing for you know because so they it mask can each hide other. the wine is what you're saying. It can yeah, hide the can. wine. So if you've got a really mm. bad bottle of wine, give people loads of cheese. You're all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was my student days in a nutshell. Frankly, <laughs> yes. Mm. I'm now trying brie with can, the sweetness. Can you read the that. Can you read the tastings on so people put their? It's on. It's is it is, on. Yeah. Oh, well, it's ahead of the game. So what have we got? So apple, apple apricot. apricot, tastes better than it smells. It does have like that mm. slight smokiness about it on the nose. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because it's almost like a kind of slightly a characteristic you might get from a bit of oak time, but it, this is this has been almost was entirely stainless, wasn't it? Yeah, all stainless. Yeah, all stainless. Um, the uh, the only things that are adding to that texture is the malolactic yeah. and the lees. Um, no oak in there at all. Um, mm, interesting. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a lovely wine. It's a very drinkable. Um, no, thirteen percent alcohol, so it's not massive. Um, which is kind of cool. Which is kind of cool. So, Kath prefers the brie to the cheddar with the chardonnay. That's okay. interesting. I, I I I think I slightly I mm, I don't know. Because I'm trying it with two different crackers. That was very decisive. Was, I'm being incredibly indecisive indeed. But oh, your your cracker cheese wine. This is wine like trying comp- to choose which is your two your 
which of your favourite child out of the two of them? You know, well, you, you like at least one of these cheeses. <laughs> that's, that's that's harsh, but um, yeah, no, it's um, um, I I do like the salinity with the Chardonnay, and I think mm. it kind of it it starts bringing out a bit more of that sort of so mouth water. I think that's the thing when we talk about food and wine pairings. Yeah. And cheese is a very small part of it, but mm-hmm. we're looking at fattiness, salinity, spice, weight, yep. all those kind of sweetness, all those kind of things. And you can have this kind of compare and contrast. Yeah. So with the... I am listening. <laughs> with the Chardonnay and the kind of richness and that like heaviness and the fattiness in the cheddar, yeah? Yeah. That's almost a compare. They go side by side. But then when you've got that really kind of like... The brie is much richer, much heavier, much more fatty... Yep. Much cream. So rather than trying to balance it with the fruit and the weight of the Chardonnay, you're looking at the acidity in the Chardonnay to cut through. So you're doing this contrasting pairing. Okay. Yeah, that okay. Makes... yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That's good. I'm just seeing if I've managed to find this video yet. So it's transferred off my laptop onto this. Um, I shall have a look. Well, he's playing. Oh, I'm playing around. We're going to move to Rosé, I think. No way, Rosé. And this is in here. Just for the fact, we're trying to keep everything, you know, all the different styles. You can try all the styles with all the cheeses. Um, and for me, this might be something to play with a fruit cheese. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who, you know, in the world of in the world of high-end cheese um, that I know that are kind of anti-fruit cheeses. They're like, you shouldn't put cheese in fruit. Uh, cheese in fruit? Exactly. You definitely shouldn't put cheese in fruit. But fruit and cheese shouldn't do that either. It's for the portable um, cheese. But it's about, once again, it's about what you like and what you enjoy. So we are now heading over to Italy, Walla. We are heading over to Italy. And uh, we've got a little, just a shot of the, the, the some of their vineyards. Now, this is quite an interesting sort of wine operation. So for those of you, I know there are a few people who sort of might know the wine industry and who might not. Um there is a, an organisation called Liberty Wines, and they are one of the big importers into the country. And they they bring in a lot of they they go around they source wines and they they import them. And um, they they were founded by a master of wine, and um, they started branching out in some of their own actual projects, winemaking projects. And they, being a commercial organisation, they know that they have to hit a variety of price points at the cheap well. At the, the lower end price point, generally speaking, what your brands do is they source what's called bulk wine, which has been kind of made in massive sort of cooperative facilities. And they might do a blend of their own bit of that bulk wine, a bit of that bulk wine. Let's put them together to make something a bit new. Put a label on it. Happy days. But this is this has got a dedicated winemaking team with a New Zealand winemaker. Um, Chris, wasn't it? Um, Matt. Matt Thompson. Sorry, my brain's gone today. So Matt Thompson, who who you know worked it out his early career in there, uh, New Zealand's now moved over and is working in this Alpha Zeta project, trying to make all sorts of wines across the Veneta region of Italy. And um, um, what they do, which is different, is they're still going for those those more accessible price points, but they're going off and they're sourcing individual growers and individual parcels of fruit. And they're saying we want this one, and by the way, could you do this in the vineyard to improve this a bit? And then they bring the things together and they try to create a house style, but they're feeding back and you've got that nicely circular thing. It's not just, I don't care what's available on the market at the cheapest price. Mm. It's cultivating relationships with growers, yeah. which is the healthy way of doing it. So this is basically a Rosé Amarone. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so, so you're, you look at the grapes. You're, you're, it's, it's Corvina, it's Rodnella, it's got a bit of Merlot yeah. in there. Um, but it's from the hillside. So it's got some heritage. It's from the hillsides of Verona. So really cool. Um, and I just think this has, it's got lovely fruit. And I think the world has gone very Provence heavy in the world of rosé. It has to be this really light colour. It has to be Provence. It has to be dry. This is not those things. This has got a bit of weight about it. It's got some nice fruit. The colour's a little bit, a little bit deeper, a little bit more salmony than this very, very mm-hmm. light pink of Provence. And it's got something about it. There's... Sometimes, you know, you go to the south of France and it's just, it's cold, it's wet, and it does what it yeah. does. This has got a bit of texture about it. Um, 12.5% alcohol. So, you know, for it being quite ripe, 
not silly amounts of alcohol. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the color, the color comes from, you know, they press the Corvina and that's where they try and get most of the color from, okay. uh, from the Corvina, yeah. which is a quite a dark gray mm. as it is. And that's why you're going to have this lovely, lovely rose color. So this, I think, you know, you look at the fruits, we've, we've got a bit of Wensley there with cranberry in it. And Okay, go on, let's give that a go then. Cranberry and Wednesday now. Are you having some? No, I'm just letting you just be there. Just let me do all the eating. I know. What can I say? What can I say? <laughs> That's keep, fair. Keep, keeping you involved. Um, but yeah, bright, fresh fruits. It's got a little bit of a stewed fruit. Um, but this this is just to be... Is that the cheese or the wine? But just to be clear, this is, you know, this is a dry wine. You know, about five grams RS. So it's still it's drier than a champagne, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important here that sometimes people get fruitiness and sweetness confused and we've got to be very very clear on that because fruitiness is perception mm -hmm. and sweetness is a fact there's either sugar or there's not sugar so obviously the dried cranberries in this will have lots of sugar in them they so will you're indeed. now going up against something with actual sugar mm. um yeah so I, I think that's an important thing to to say because you taste something like strawberry and your your mind thinks strawberry, well, that's sweet and that's got sugar because that's what a strawberry is. But you're not actually, there's no strawberries in this wine. We're not squeezing a bit of strawberry juice in there to give it the flavour. So there isn't that sugar, uh, but you've got these flavours that, that look like it. But I like this. Is there any, any thoughts in the chat on uh, pairings and what cheeses are going well with this? So all nice and simple thoughts. So presumably just enjoying it, which is, it, I think the the so the the fruit flavors often comes from the, the the skins of the grapes. So you've got to go to a sort of an orange wine or a rosé to get some of those fruity, really sort of you know more complex fruits, other than the simpler sort of acid driven lemons and limes and things, into it. Um, but those those flavor things <clears throat> will often bind with protein, won't they? And they do something quite different when when they're doing that. So, it's it's why you, when you've got uh, you, you start seeing what what the tannins doing to your tongue, it starts doing very weird things. But you've got that same kind of interaction with the cheese as well. It's strange, isn't it? Because you taste taste the wine first, mm -hmm. and the wine tastes fruity, and rich. You have that bit of cranberry cheese with it, and the wine tastes much drier afterwards. It doesn't does, it? yeah. It's yeah. Much, it feels the much overall, drier. When you're tasting them both at the same time, it's got that beautiful sweetness to it. Um, but it's such a different experience. And then when you go back to the wine, and suddenly, oh, you're mi noticing the lack of that sugar, mm. which is quite. I think cool. and there's, there's not a right or wrong answer. Um, and I think that's <clears throat> hugely important with so many wines. There's not a right or wrong answer about what's better. Is it better with food or not with food or with some food? It's just a different experience. Um, and it's it will always come down to personal preference of what you like, what you like. If you like it when it tastes a bit fruitier, you don't want to have any cheese with it. No. If you like it when don't. it tastes a little bit drier, you've got a pairing. So that's what's, that's what's really important. Um, we think we might finally have got our video uh, onto the right device. Okay. Which is so should we? So we might give that a go. Should we introduce? And... Should we introduce wine number four very quickly so people sure, can have something to drink? Because your <clears throat> your videography yeah. skills has given you. Uh, we've got about six minutes to hang out with it, haven't they? <laughs> That's true. But first, <laughs> <laughs> what does a cheese alcoholic call for? Morbier. <laughs> Excellent. That I, I I I tell you, I have not heard that one before. I have not that, heard that that's one. Excellent. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna edit that out of the <laughs> video afterwards. So anyone else watching it, so um, on next week's tasting, I can uh, nick it for myself because that is <laughs> epic. <clears throat> excellent. That Very is good. epic Very good indeed. Um, let's let's pop the video on, and um, we all... shall see you in a. Uh, oh no, we no the Pinot Noir. Pinot it's Noir. Sorry, we got excited by Morbier. It did, it did indeed. So, we're just going to get it in the glass, and we'll chat about it when we come back. We'll put the tasting notes up so you can pop them in. But we are heading to Australia, to Yarra Valley, to Giant Steps, for a little bit of Pinot Noir. But while we sip the Pinot Noir... It's not oh, I've glass. got no glasses. 
while we sip the Pinot Noir, Alex is going to attempt to oh, give it a try. do a video. So we'll see you in Six momentarily minutes. or slightly longer than momentarily. <laughs> For hundreds of years, records indicate that wine and cheese from the same places have been served together. And from a historical point of view, this of course makes plenty of sense. Many cheese and wine styles have grown up together, often on the same farm or within a small village. And it's precisely because of this proximity that regional recipes were created and the flavours all matched together. As people drank and ate, the makers actively worked to try to enhance this and create a beautiful synergy of textures. Passed down from generation to generation, these pairings continue to exist centuries later. And being the home of both products, the roots of wine and cheese pairings go no deeper than those found here in Europe. Both are ways of preserving the goodness of natural substances that quickly go off, so instead they can last for years. And both are biological processes that turn a simple substance into something more complex and delicious. The historic Brie region of France, just southeast of Paris and bordering on Champagne and Burgundy, has created one of the most popular wine and cheese pairings for centuries, Brie and Beaujolais. Italy, of course, another major wine and cheese producer, has strong ties to regionalism. For example, Asiago cheese is often recommended alongside Chianti or Brunello, which come from nearby. In addition to regional customs, some commonly held pieces of wisdom about pairings seem rooted in long-standing traditions, especially from, well, it's us again, the early British wine merchants. For example, white wine with fish and red wine with meat is a traditional piece of wisdom based on the concept of matching the richness or body of a wine with the heaviness of a given food. And while Jamie may disagree, this rule of thumb still stands today, although the art of pairing wine with various different types of food has grown far more sophisticated over the years. British wine merchants often repeated the saying, buy on an apple and sell on cheese. In other words, if a wine tastes good with a sugary acidic apple when you try it, it's very likely to go well with many cheeses when you sell it. Similar to this is the idea of pairing strong wines with strong cheeses. Full-bodied wines often pair with strong, flavorful cheese because if you combine a subtle flavor with a strong flavor, the subtler one just gets lost, so you may as well not be having it. As wine and food have become more global, as well as the classic pairings, we're starting to see far more creativity and unlikely combinations that sound, well, ridiculous, but they just work. Anyway, we'll talk more about that later, but it might be worth going a little into how cheese is made. Since milk is of course the star of the show, to make cheese you need your milk to be just right. And what that means differs from cheese to cheese, so many makers start by processing their milk to change things like the ratio of protein to fat. It also often involves heat treatment such as pasteurization, which kills the bugs which could spoil the cheese. And it also helps prime the milk for starter cultures to grow more effectively. Now winemaking is very similar. We of course try to wait for nature to get the right balance and ratio between sugar and acid. We often then use a small amount of preservatives to kill what's growing on the grape skins before we add in our own starter cultures, and in this case we use yeast. The next step in the cheese making process is adding these bacteria which acidify the milk. Now if you've ever tasted sour milk you'll know that left long enough milk will acidify on its own. And likewise, the yeast on the skin of the grapes would turn that juice into wine too. The problem with both of these processes is you never know exactly what you're dealing with. And these microbes could make delicious flavors or they could make disgusting ones. And then of course we keep the liquid at the right temperature for the magic to happen. Here is where it starts to get a little bit different. The milk is still liquid at this point, but of course cheese is solid. The process of curdling the milk to make it solid can happen with natural products. In the past, cheesemakers used this natural renin, but today they prefer to use rennet, which is a lab-created equivalent. As the solid curd forms, the liquid byproduct remains known as whey. In winemaking, we start off generally with must, which is a mushy combination of squash grapes, and over time this separates into the juice or wine, and the skins, pulps and seeds are all left behind. After the curds and whey have separated and fermented, the curd forms a big blob. Cheesemakers use long knives to cut them, creating more surface area so they can separate even more. Later steps might involve cooking the curds, or stirring them, or both to finish the process off. The more they're cooked and stirred, the drier the end cheese will be. Another optional step is to wash the curd, which replaces the whey with water. Washed curd cheeses tend to be a little bit more elastic and have a milder flavour. And these are things like Gouda, Havarti or the Swedish Fontina. At this point, the curds and whey should be sufficiently separated. So it's time to remove all the whey completely, which means draining it, leaving only solid chunks of curd. And these could be big or small, depending on how finely it's been cut up. In some cases, draining it naturally is quite enough. 
but for harder cheeses it's likely to get a bit of help from a mould or a press. And of course in winemaking we either let the juice run freely away or we press it out. Wine that comes from free run juice is generally simpler and more elegant, whereas pressed wine can have a bit more complexity but can also be more tannic. For some cheeses, another step removes even more moisture and this is known as cheddaring. After cutting it into sections, they are all stacked on top of each other, where the gravity helps squeeze a little bit more out, resulting in a denser, more crumbly cheese texture. The fermentation is also continuing during this process, and when it's finally ready, the cheesemaker will mill the curd slabs, producing smaller pieces. Finally, it is starting to look a lot more like cheese, so to add flavour, some salt is added. And this can either involve sprinkling on salt crystals or submerging the whole cheese into brine. And this is done for things like mozzarella. At this point is where we can also add other flavours like pepper, horseradish, garlic, chives, rosemary, basil, dill, anything you like really. For many cheeses, the focus is simply on developing and intensifying the natural flavours. If we're to look for an equivalent to this in wine, it's probably where we put it in oak barrels which add their own flavours but also help the wine develop. With nothing left to add to the cheese, it's ready to be shaped. Even with so much moisture removed, it's still soft, so cheesemakers press the curd into moulds to create the right shapes. For many cheeses, this process is now finished, but for others, aging it in a controlled, cool environment can help the cheese harden and the flavours to really intensify. And that can take anywhere from a few days to many years. In some cases, mould also develops, which adds unique colours and flavours. And likewise, many wines are designed to be drunk young, whereas many wines age beautifully when they're cellared for a few years. So do young cheeses pair better with young wines? Well, I'll leave that to Jamie and Ben. But one of the lovely things is that when you take the time to appreciate just how much time, effort and care went into making your favourite wines and cheese, you'll hopefully find they taste even more delicious. Do we really need any more of an excuse to tuck in? I think not. Welcome back. Welcome so back. there we are. So a little bit of a pinot in, in the glass and, you know, deciding what cheese that was going to go. Did I tell you about the time I was going to write um, a scientific paper about cheese and wine pairing? Go on. I just couldn't decide what my hypothesis was going to be. Oh, God. There are a few holes in that argument, that's for sure. Uh, right. And um, Kathy, how do the well cheat their cheese carefully? Of course, that makes an awful, awful lot of sense. Um, we now have a sensible comment here. So, oh, let's not put that up then. Yeah. Now, wine four tastes very different with mild cheese or smoked cheese, and that I think is a very good point. The video was talking about strong flavored wines, full bodied wines like a Cabernet Sauvignon can cope with a really strong flavored food accompaniment. Um, Pinot is quite a subtle wine. This is this is a this is a really nice one, by the way. I really enjoy this. Mm. It's got that beautiful, beautiful, intense fruit. But also some kind of... Nice... Neil Armstrong's favourites. Yeah, this is the one that you would take when you're walking on the moon, of course, because... Uh, no, you don't like need to see. Yeah, we don't need that. So anyway, so Giant Steps, we're in we're in Yarra Valley, we're in Australia, so we're down near uh, we're Victoria, we're near Melbourne. Um, so quite a cool climate region. Um, I've actually been to Giant Steps and it's fantastic, fantastic wine, <laughs> really cool. Um, but what's interesting about this is... They've got the lots thing. of different vineyard sites. So they've got Sexton, they've got uh, Applejack, they've got Tarara, um, they've got Wombat Creek. <laughs> um, and then they take all that the... maybe the best name ever. Oh, like yeah, Wombat, Wombat Creek, Creek. Vineyards. Um, but mm. what they do is they take different plots and do it and add this and add that. And they did that. And I'm going to check my notes before I lie about which does what. But it says in the tasting notes here, that you get this perfume cherry note coming from the Sexton Vineyard, Campari okay. notes from the Applejack Vineyard, and Campari. then and then which is that kind of yeah that slightly bittering agent, um, and then Tariford gives you a mocha and cacao earthiness. Um, I don't drink enough Campari to tell you what 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 it tastes like, but but mocha yeah I can get that, and I certainly get the the cherry. That's 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 crystal clear. But I think, you know, this is once again, we talk about wines and, you know, we talk about blending. When we talk about blends, people think, oh, it's Cabernet Sauvignon plus Cabernet Franc plus Merlot plus this. That's not necessarily what a blend has to be. <clears throat> this is all Pinot Noir. Yeah. But it's a blend from that yeah, vineyard, that noirs. vineyard, that vineyard to go, hey, I want a lot of that characteristic, yeah. a little yeah. bit of this characteristic. I'm going to balance it with that characteristic oh, that allows you to make that really, really great wine. Really very nice. Um, but I, 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 so for the smoked cheese that we've got, it does slightly overload it. Um, 
I guess it de- it depends on the cheese, you know. That's 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 the the fun thing about it. But we've got some um some of that really peppery salami as well. I think that also would probably slightly overload it. So I'm going to try a little bit of that. Hmm. But I think that's the thing. Um, and it is about stylistically, and I agree. This um this smoked cheese, a little bit too smoky for this. But it doesn't mean it doesn't go with Pinot Noir. Mm. If we went to Santa Barbara and we were yeah. drinking a big over jammy Santa Barbara Pinot mm. with that kind of smokiness, you might get away with it. Interestingly, the pepper on that that salami really changes the profile again, and and it kind of brings out those slightly meaty characteristics that you get that you get in the, the Pinot. And if if if, if 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 Jarlsberg did wine pairings, they'd probably be <laughs> the best in the world. <laughs> No, not today. <laughs> it's not working. I've been trying to eat this blue cheese for ages, but there's still tons of it left. Still tons, still tons of it. Let's see, I, I, don't get, I don't get it. <laughs> I need more beer. Let's have a nice, you. yeah, more more beer. Um, slight smokiness goes well with the smoked cheese. Yeah, I, 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 I there is definitely that smoke. It's, it's where your level is, um, level, and it depends how your cheese has been smoked, whether it's been yes. over the top or if it's been smoked. Well, yeah, but you think carefully. about whiskies, don't you? You've got, you've got, you've got, you've got whiskies which have a very gentle peat smoke kind of character to them, and then you've got things like Lafroig, which are less gentle. And uh, that is one way to say <laughs> that's it. That's yes. one, one way to yes. say it. So, but yeah, so there's, there's there's this whole sliding scale, but um, yeah, I think. Uh, Naturally smoked for a mild smoking flavour. Well, there you go. That that's a that's a, a, a good description. So I think we're on the right line. So a mildly that, that, smoked that one is, with a that thing is the most supermarket tasting line I think ever. <laughs> Naturally smoked for a mild smoky flavour. Naturally smoked was it? <laughs> it reminds me of this 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 wine that I tried from um uh how it's not. Naturally smoked, is it? Because the, the the cheese wasn't just sat there, and suddenly there was a fire, and you know it just yeah, naturally yeah, happened. Yeah. It was this wandering, was wandering through the California wildfires <laughs> with a pint of milk on my back. It curled a bit, naturally smoked it. I dropped it on the ground. It got squashed and indeed suddenly this this was the my naturally smoked lucky, cheese. Lucky, uh, na- um, I I when I was I think I said this, but when I was on the Greek islands uh, last summer um, on um, Zakynthos, um, I tried a smoked rosé wine, which would certainly have paired with any smoked cheese because the level of smoke in it was really up there. But the, the winemaker had made it when naturally there had been a wildfire that had gone through the vineyards. The grapes had got smoke taint. He thought, well, you know what, I might as well give it a try and see what happens. Why not? And he, he made it. He didn't particularly like it, but he so sold it to some people, and some people said, "That's brilliant." And he sold all of it, so he made more the next year with, while at, by actually lighting fires underneath. So the, he chose right, to he make chose, a he chose to make a smoked wine exactly on. afterwards. And why not? Why not? Let's have a look at these tastes now. I think these may be the most interesting. The taste like so. There's some cool ones in here, like rhubarb and custard sweets. Ah, oh, that's great. It's got that slightly confected thing. Yeah, doesn't it? it really yeah, does. For really sure. does. Uh, you know, light smoke. <laughs> I think that might straw- be the best tasting note of the And yeah, and you, you know the strawberry stewed straw, and that that's <laughs> the difference in wine, isn't it? I you know, know, you can say strawberry, and is it is it a fresh strawberry? Is it macerated strawberry? Is it stewed strawberry? You know, and there, there's there's different yeah. kind of styles on that. Um, so I'm going to be a heathen and try a bit with the the cream cheese because pinots often have quite good acidity as well. But what will this combination of the creamy cheese and the... <laughs> Have you seen Kathy's... Uh, can you pop that up when you get a second? The uh, What it says on the front versus what it says on the back. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And it's the same in wine. We use, you know, there's certain things that we say, you know, hey, this has a little touch of Brett compared to this tastes like sweaty horse. Which one would you prefer? Marketing versus reality. Yeah. Um... So we've also got a technical question about have any of the grapes gone in whole um, or, uh, or or is it? And I think I, I think it's about I read 10%, the was some. yeah about ten percent about ten percent whole bunch yes. in this, mm-hmm. um, which you do get that little bit of it's bubble gumminess. So yeah, yeah hand harvested there. It's, but it's very under control. It's, it's not yeah. There's not enough in there that <clears throat> I would go wow. This is you know. Yeah, this is Beaujolais. This is yeah. yeah, this is Beaujolais. Um, Alex likes about ten percent because he can pick a wine up. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, a, bit, a, bit, a whole bunch in there. There is, there is a bit of whole bunch in there for sure. Um, <clears throat> but you've got to be really careful when you do that that your stems are 
super right now given that i know we have winemakers on the in here i heard a brilliant tip for winemakers so this is going to be relevant to about one percent of our audience but if you're ever tempted to sort of you know dabble with winemaking why not give it a go now okay these stems when they're sort of green and young can give some quite bitter flavors and when they're more sort of woody they can give some really delightful flavours to the wine. So if you're putting the whole bunches in, you are going to extract some flavours from those stems. And if you go around trying to eat the stalk of your grapes, you'll probably notice that it's not a great experience. If you want to know what flavour components that is going to add to the wine, it's quite hard to do it by looking at the stems. A lot of winemakers say that they they can do that, but you take your stalks and you chop it up with a pair of scissors and pop them all into a glass. And then you add a little bit of neutral, like some grain alcohol, which is a solvent. And that actually draws out the the aromatics that you're going to end up in the wine. So if you go and have a smell of this, after only like, say, leave it for 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, then go and have a smell of this the thing. And if you get things like uh, oolong tea, bergamot, you know, then you get all sorts of delightful flavours. You're going, well, that's a flavour I want in my wine. So I'm let's go, let's go 40%, let's go, let's go all in, let's put a bit more in there. If it's all green, underripe, very kind of sort of, you know, you know, slightly not sort of like, like, yeah, asparagus when it's not at its best kind of flavours, then probably pop them through the de stemmer. So what you're saying is make a stem martini. Make a stem martini, exactly, exactly. So yes, indeed. Um, Am I dabbling with winemaking this year? No. Um, <laughs> well, well, maybe. <laughs> Ludicrous wine. Yeah, maybe. It, 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 it's, if we do anything, it will be a mini fun, yeah, yeah, fun project. single barrel project. Exactly. Um, for everyone to yeah. drink. Uh, I, I haven't I, yeah, I haven't done it for a couple of years. And of course, with the loss of the Tring site, I don't have my winery license anymore. So unfortunately, it's going to be having to be in partnership with another winery. But... Hey, do you know what? That might be a good thing. But we're going back to um, going back to the USA, aren't we? Is that what anyone would think you're, you're quite obsessed with the place. Um, very for wine number five. Very American. Let's flick the tasting notes. So I have one final look at those. But I think that's great. It I is cherry, that strawberry, smoke. that slightly candied, that cloviness yeah. you get, um, and yeah, that candiness comes from your whole bunch. The cloves come from that little bit of spice and the choice of different vineyards, which I think is just really cool. And yeah. what what's lovely, I think. You know, when you can put tasting notes up and go, here are the tasting notes, but then we can explain these are the tasting notes because, and I think that's great that there's a yeah. rhyme or a reason behind these tasting notes. And, you know, people, when we're trying to find out what wines we like and what wines we don't like, um, you can pour yourself. Um, people go, I really oh, I like strawberry-ish wines. I like wines that taste like this. I don't like wines yeah. that taste like that. But if we can... You know, we work out that when it's a little bit confected, we can use terms like whole bunch if we want to get a little yeah. bit geeky. You know, if we you want... go into a wine shop and say, I don't like wine with whole bunch. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't like, like wines that have whole bunch or stem or carbonic maceration. And, you know, yeah. we, we start at one level and go, I don't like white, I don't like yep. red. And then we can pick out the flavors that we do like and the flavors that we don't like. And it's really great that the tasting notes you guys are putting up match the story that we're telling about the wine, yeah. which is which it's is absolutely convenient. epic. Convenient. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> it's a little bit a little bit embarrassing if it didn't. Um okay, so we are going back to California. Now this is this is what, named what wine after, du Carl. Wine du Carl, Van du Carl. Um the uh California, for those who have spent a bit of time there, isn't actually necessarily quite as warm in the summer as everybody likes to think it is. Um because while it, the inland part is super, super, super sunny, the whole of the coast gets this, this, this band of fog, which drops the temperature by an astronomical amount. And it's at the heart of why places like Santa Barbara can make Pinot Noir, despite, despite being super, super warm. It's got this cooling influence from the sea, but also this fog. And I will never forget that one of the, the first times that we went... Um, my friend came from where they live in Silicon Valley and drove to us. We met them at Carmel uh, on the Sea, which is a stunning little town, beautiful sandy beach. And um, we had to light the fire. It was that cold. And it had dropped. It was um, 93 Fahrenheit in Silicon Valley. And it got to 
got got there and it was sort of well I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit but it was sort of near the freezing point and it was genuinely that different so so you get this incredible incredible fog um uh, influence and you see it rolling over the hills and you can see it dropping the the, the condensation on the, the the west side of the mountains as it comes in from the Pacific but it's it's at the heart of why you can make some quite surprising wines in California um and so that's why they've named this Fog Mountain because of the Foggy Mountains. It's a it's a it's a reasonable call. So okay, sure, so, Merlot, so this, I'm is, not this is this is right? you know California AVA. So they source wine yeah, from up and up place. and down California. So it's not from a particular point in California. Nine percent Merlot, a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon in there. Which when you taste it, I think you get that kind of like that little bit of rustic, mm-hmm. that little bit of greenness about it, a little bit more texture. You know, if it was all yeah. Merlot, it would just be fruit, 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 tiny fruit, bit of herbaceousness. Fruit. Yeah, that little bit of green, that little bit of herbaceousness that takes it from just being what I think without the Cabernet Sauvignon it would just be drinky get on with it yeah with the cab it makes it a little bit more of a serious wine a little bit more technical of a wine a little bit there so Alex is getting some blue cheese with this I'm going to try some blue cheese with it yeah I don't know so I think this, right the, I do, think this is well you tell feels, us yeah you tell us my, my theory would be this sits in the uh the smoked cheese category would be very good with this with that little bit of herbaceousness that little bit of spice um mm-hmm. the blue cheese I think it depends where your blue cheese is. If you've got a really big, bold, stinky blue cheese, you might be a bit OTT. But if you've got kind of like a, a lighter, creamier yeah. Stilton or a Roaring Forties or something like that, it's I think it could be good it as again. well. Blue cheese is overpowering it. Hmm. Okay, so I'll try the slightly... I'll try your, your recommendation. Last time we did the one cheese one, I tried to pick some wines to go with it, and Jamie tried to pick some. And guess what? It turned out that the trained sommelier actually did a better job of it so uh less than learned this time he's picked them all <laughs> step by step eh? step by step um mm-hmm. mm. but yeah so but what what i'm hoping that we've That's seen through good. tonight you know most of the wines we've picked are fairly standardized styles that you can pick up any day of the week for any dinner party for anything that you want to drink um yeah it's it's the cab it's absolutely mm-hmm. the cab you Baked. can get tannin with Merlot. You know, it's one of those bizarre things, isn't it? It's like when you look at Bordeaux, everyone assumes that the, the Merlot is just sort of smooth, low tannin. But actually, they 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 kind of, in the places where, it, on the different sides of the river, you get very different profiles from the Merlot that grows there. And it, it might be a little bit more tannic in the clay soils. So... That's where they'll go. Well, okay, that's why we have a little bit more of this because it still gives you a, a decent structured wine um, there. But it, over here, generally pretty low tannins, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I lost lost my lost my bear in the uh, in the woods the other day. I stood at the edge of the woods just shouting, "Come on, bear! Come on, bear!" Oh, what? I'm just I'm just oh, trying to be I'm just trying me. to be. And on that, that note, good night. It's been a pleasant <laughs> placing. Yeah. No, um, not I, I think the idea of Bates Camembert is 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 a rather wonderful one, um, and just because like, Bates this Camembert is, just is great. Anytime. I'm I'm diving in on this. I'm diving in on Tristan's you do recommendation that, you do here. Do you know what? If you keep making cheese jokes, I might have to quit. I just can't unbear it any longer. <laughs> Sorry, were you just on your phone looking at cheese puns? <laughs> <laughs> Off your foot. You can't chat GPT cheese puns. Okay, that's not that's not fair. Is that not fair? Um, oh, Patricia, I completely agree with that. I think the that saltiness in the cheddar it brings out the fruit, the sweetness, that kind of raspberry and cranberry. I think I think that's really good, really mm. good. Cheddar is just a great cheese. But even you know, you think things like Gruyere in that same kind of category, aren't they? They've mm. got that. That really beautiful sort of complexity and saltiness. Yeah, it's is. it's the salinity that mm. does it. The salinity and that crumbly texture, mm. and it's it is, and it's the difference between you know, there's cheese and there's cheese. You know, the same way that there's wine and there's wine. There's kind of you know, there's wine that does the job, yeah, and it's made with grapes and it does what it does. And then there's artisanal wine that's made by a person from a particular yeah. farm, particular <clears throat> dairy, particular creamery, yeah. And the difference is these cheeses that are made like that. And if anyone's joining us next week or on both, we've got um, yeah, yeah. we've got Jess from Mouse and Great coming on with us, and she is uh, she's the twit. She's you know 
there's a cheese qualification, the same as you can do like yeah. WSET, like Academy of Cheese. She's qualified and all that. So she's coming on to talk to us about cheese and wine and all that good stuff. Yeah, I mean, we can give you a, a slight sort of preview of that, which is this is much like you often find these flavour wheels about wines. Um, bonus point for anybody who can read it, because unfortunately this won't let me zoom in, which is uh, a mildly irritating thing. But again, you can sort of see where the different kind of structure groups come from. So we'll dive but into that a bit more. If, if you are if you have an interest in that, dive to yeah. the, the uh, just Google the Academy of Cheese. Uh, fantastic, fantastic site. It's a uh, it's on my bucket list when I get a, a spare moment it's to study a, to study something new. I really want to get into that. I think it's really, really cool. So, you know, how to chat to his... Whoa, look at these tasting notes. <laughs> Full body, millions but not of them. Beats. I love that. <laughs> oh, Excellent. my word. Are they describing the wine or me? Yeah. Yes, that, that's my Good new title. Question. Good question. Yeah. Can I get that in the back, label in the back of my jumper? <laughs> Full body, but not... But yeah, loads of stuff going on with this. Everything from red cherry to licorice to... Nutmeg. Yeah, loads of cool spices and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think I this is... a bit of a Gerico ham with that. Because oh, I really like a Gerico ham. Of course you are. Of course you are. Nice. <laughs> yes, chef. Yes, chef. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, cheddar is great with this. Blue, if you've got... Um... There we are. Tristan, Tristan's on the case. Tristan is going to get invited in next time to do the cheese pairings for, for, our, next, for our next big wine and cheese event. <laughs> I think that's important. Um, but yeah, I think there's lovely richness to this. A little yeah. bit of spice. Um, it's a very drinkable wine. It's got enough of interest to stop it just being throwaway. Kind mm. of, it's just grape juice. It's yeah, that it's not just because sometimes when you get those wines, I'm getting very generic here. It's yeah. going to murder me. That just are California ABA. Yeah, they can just be <laughs> grape the juice the and drink can it. Be Grape juice, or it can be great yeah. juice. <laughs> I didn't I, I'm just setting up for a cheese. I didn't, actually. yeah, I didn't yeah, come no, here with no, great no. expectations. Uh, um, but it, seriously, that the, the label that put, gets put on it is increasingly kind of sort of meaningless as people start trying to, you know, do creative things like multi vintage brands, like wine that's come from different years blended together. Sounds like an obvious way to try to make a cheap thing. Doesn't have to be. You make some well, great wines for that. Champagne, champagne, exactly. <laughs> An obvious, obvious to that. So, and and again, anyone who tries to diss Merlot, it... oh, cheddar and fruit cake. That okay, <clears throat> right. So that's so, what we got to do. So right. there's a big there's a, there's a fruit cake, but we've there's a the bit there's a big shout um, from a cheese shop that I used to work at that it's cheddar on apple pie, which is apparently legendary. I've never had it. Cheddar on apple pie. Mm -hmm. That's an extraordinary uh, recommendation. Uh -huh. Interesting. Let's have a little bit of that. The entire show stops while um, well, we, me and Alex have quince paste. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Interesting. I like that idea. Yeah, that's that's very, very nice. So well, not quite the same as fruitcake, but so we should probably move on to the yeah, well, maybe we're about sweetness. maybe the most classic, the classic well-known yeah. wine and cheese pairing there is. Now, huge apologies to if you've been set with us for the last few months and you've been through. Well, we did lots of port things at Christmas, and we've told you all these stories again. Um, the lovely thing about this club is that members come and go and take a pause and then come back and it's, and some it's stay forever and some stay forever and we are eternally grateful for, for those who've done and we hope that we can give you enough, enough lots of nice exciting things to keep it fresh and interesting so we are going back to sandyman's port and because they're good because they're good they're, they're just one of the really good producers of port and this one is the reserve, the, the reserve, founders, founders reserve, reserve ruby, and it's a yeah, a ruby port, yeah, exactly. So this is in. It's got yeah, the usual suspects. It's the usual blend of Roris, Barocca, Ticacao, Torriga Franca. Um, I mean, you the say usual, usual as if everyone has that well, rolling off well, their tongue. Uh, the usual port <laughs> yeah, grapes. It's not, so not unusual. It's the grapes that you find in port, indigenous to the area. You don't really see them growing anywhere else no. in the world. What it is, so. Port goes with blue cheese. Yes? 
That's the standard. That's what everybody says, what everybody else. Yeah. And I completely agree with that. However, the tale goes, do you know? Well, I, I'm leading this up to you. Like, do you know why? And they go, no, tell no, me. I don't. But tell we've me also again. done this. Yeah, tell me for the hundredth <laughs> time today the, uh, the Port and Cheese story. So, you know, we, fortified wine. Well, that's not that one. Let's have this. Fortified wines so for designed to go around the world. Yeah, fortified wines really kind of started in the 1200s. Um, you know, both Portugal and Spain. So port from Portugal, sherry from Spain, because people wanted to move wine around the world. And when it got from wherever it started to wherever it finished mm -hmm. on boats, the wine had just <clears throat> wasn't any good anymore. It had oxidized, it had gone bad, it, whatever had happened to it. <laughs> so they thought, how do we protect this? So it's a preservative game. So to preserve things, Add more alcohol. So alcohol preserves, salt preserves, sugar preserves. So if you could have something that was, had sugar in it and alcohol in it, you'd be able to preserve it. So they started making fortified wines. And you see, you know, Australia, a lot of Australia, you know, in the oh, 1600s, yeah. Yeah. you know, was it was all fortified all wines. Fortified wines yeah. <coughs> and Australia only became, you know, a global force really from about the 1970s yeah. because they were able to get stuff moved around a bit quicker. Um, so, yeah, you know, a lot... You know, a lot of California was, you know, bulk, fortified -y kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, anything that was traveling was that. But we like, always talk to, like to pair at the same sweetness levels, don't we, with desserts and things like that. You are going to have a super sweet dessert. You want to have quite a sweet wine to go with it. So I'm kind of intrigued just to, uh, before while you go on to the story, what I'm going to be nibbling in the background and cogitating on is, is the cranberry cheese. So I'm going to give that a go. And... <laughs> If you've got some of the nice cranberry... Um... Alex will boo back momentarily mm. with his thoughts while I continue I'll telling my stories. Um, so, yeah, so, as things got shipped around the world, cheese from France became, you know, cheese from France and, you know, cheese from England wanted to get kind of moved around as well. And you'd have your nice big wheel of Stilton. And by the time you got it on your boat and it got a little bit warm, it grew, you get there, cut it open, full of maggots, which... Um, there's some, there's, I can't remember the name of the cheese. There is a cheese that is you're full of maggots, and yeah, that's the style of it. That's supposed to be nice. Um, but it's not the standard for most cheese. The most no. cheese is meant to be made with milk and less, more milk, less maggots. Um, so you don't, they'd open up these wheels of Stilton maggots in the middle. So they thought, how do we get less maggots per Stilton? Is that the, the ratio number of Yeah, that yeah. We're on? So they would core the Stilton out, and fill it into the um, into the middle of the cheese. The port the, into yeah. the middle of the cheese. I completely lost what I was saying Sorry, there, yeah. <laughs> and I've only told this story three thousand yeah. times. So what that would do? That would preserve the cheese. the cheese and stop anything going bad. And when you got to where you go, oh, are you just going to pour this port out and chuck it in a bin? No, no. So you have a glass of port, bit of cheese, well, happy days. And it's a, another thing of what goes together grows together. You know, so many food and wine and cheese pairings are historical, geographical, cultural, you know, because of what the necessity, yep. necessities were at the time. But then you, you build up that kind of um, psychological link of a happy place that you've been to. I've gone off, I've gone to Tuscany, I've had, you know, this cheese and this wine and this thing together and... I've gone to this and it was a wonderful occasion. And it, sometimes it, it really does work and create something magical. And sometimes it's just, you know, it's linked in your mind with this mm. great memory. Mm. And I think, you know, I, t I turn around people, what's the best bottle of wine you ever had? Mm. And the best bottle mm. of wine you ever had should be this experience. I was with so and so and so and so and so and here and we drank this and it was that. Um, wine is one of those few things in the world that can invoke yeah. a memory that you pick that up and you smell it and you, you're away. You remember of where you were and who it was and right. that. And I think that's absolutely amazing. And it is it is cultural. And, you know, sometimes you get what I call local lager syndrome, that you go on holiday and yeah. you drink the local beer and it's hot out and it's the best yeah. cold beer you've ever <laughs> had in your life. Six weeks later, rubbish. you do your little local shop and you're yeah. going, oh, oh it's, yeah. it's not quite the same on a cold Tuesday night when no. you're losing 4-0 in the Champions League. But, but it is. You, you made, you've made this point, though, about how some of the, the, the pairings can be just historical like this. and um, Some of them are quite magical. And I quite vividly remember what happened when we tried the cream cheese... Well, it wasn't. It wasn't the cream cheese, was it? It was the. Was it the San Marcelo? 
With the um, with the dessert wine. Oh, when we did Briat the Savaran. Briat Savaran with the Talbilk yeah. Marsan. Talbilk Marsan dessert wine. So, so creamy cheeses with dessert wines, and it tastes like vanilla ice cream. Vanilla ice cream slash lemon meringue pie thing going on. So I'm going to give it a go now, based on what you've told me, to try the cream cheese with the port and see what happens. Is this going to work? I think I think you should take a step to the bree. You should have the cream. Go for it. I just well, think it's going to go. Okay. I think that's going to be too lemony with the um. Oh, with the port. Ah. Oh. Because you're not you're sweet, but you're I'm red not... sweet rather than citrus sweet. Or in sweet like. But chocolate. he will. T- but this is joy food and wine pairing. We can go. Yeah, that worked. Or. We might have created something new, or we go, no, that's not the thing. Mm. But it's difficult to make them both bad. The cheese will still taste nice. The wine will still taste nice. But you might not go, that's a perfect match. There's nothing wrong with either of them. Because it's a red sweet wine, the red characteristic just destroys it, dominates it. The goat's goat's cheese is gone. I'm not getting any of that. So try it with the brie. Because the brie's got a little bit more creaminess to it. Okay. And you might end up, this is complete guessing because I've not done it, but if Here my theory is correct, this might turn your port into blueberry pie. It's like Willy <laughs> Wonka's cheese and wine factory here. <laughs> See, we're getting to the magic now right at the end of the tasting. Um, how about that? It's brie. He's had it there briefly. I, f- well, I don't know why I'm feeling pressure now. I'm just making stuff up from the other side of the table. It's good. It's a really good combination. Really nice. And just like blueberry pie, yeah? It do- it's not going to say I didn't it, want to it say it. I didn't want to say it. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't getting it at first. It was it was more of a kind of cranberry note there at first, but actually as the flavour develops, which it does keep going on and on and on, I'm left I hate to say it with the sensation of blueberry pie in my mouth. I hate you. <laughs> he's actually quite good, this guy. He's, he's every, actually every quite good. Again, every now and again. Um, oh, Kathy, wow. Kathy's point here. If there's a point you ever want to take away from wine, <laughs> this is the point you need to take quite away right. from wine. Quite I think it's right. hugely important. And talking of sharing wine with friends. We are um, Jamie, myself, and Vitas from our uh, from our magical machinery operation downstairs. We're going to Italy on Monday um, because we've got a few new machines that are now apparently ready. Finally, after months and months, um, that will help us really drive the club forward and um, do some very cool things: better shelf life, lower costs, and um, all fun speaking, things. All fun things. Since we're going to Italy, we thought we can't really not go to Piedmont or Piedmonte. And so, yes. so that's what so we're doing. We are taking a little trip to Piedmonte. So next month is all things English. English. We'll be going down and then to the, England. And then the following month is going to be all things Italy. So Discoverers is going to be uh, Northern Italy and Adventures is going to be a Piedmont Masterclass. Yeah. Next month, I'm going backwards here, we're going to do some English wines, and then we're going to do a Sussex masterclass, so there's some fun things happening. Oh, yeah, yeah, because, you know, Sussex is is the only sort of uh, Appalachian on its own, legally speaking, in the, in, in England. So there, there's clearly something that's worth investigating, and I, in my head, it's all still just to do with sparkling, but we're going to go and have an, a dig, because we've heard of some people growing some quite interesting things. There's there. some cool stuff. Some cool stuff, so we're going to go. And we're also, we've arranged to go, for me, to go back to school. So I'm going, we're going to be going to Plumpton College, where um, I will catch up with my old winemaking lecturers, and uh, we'll taste some of the wines that the students have made there, which... Don't get me wrong; they've actually done a gold medal winning at um, a, a sparkling wine. They they do, they aren't allowed to just do what the hell they want. It's, it's very carefully controlled. So we're going to taste some super cool wines in Sussex as well. Absolutely. So if you've loved tonight, tell your friends. It's been a pleasure having you. If you can't get enough of your wine and cheese, we've still got some packs left for next Friday. So um, yeah. Dive in, get that pack. The cheeses, you can buy the cheeses separately from our friend Jess over at Mouse and Grape 
here for the tasting next week. She's going to be on, so it's uh, yeah. some, so it's different wines. This it's some cool wines, some cool cheeses, some yeah, Italian more, stuff, more like um, yeah. and she's going to come on and talk about the difference between cheese and cheese and artisanal cheese and her um, journey into the wine and cheese world and what mouse and grape is all about. So we're really excited to have yeah. her on as a guest host. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, is there any final thoughts? Any final uh, any final tasting notes on the uh, port? Yeah, let's pull up the port tasting notes. So brandy soaked fruit that's a cracker to open with but yeah isn't it just i hadn't been actually just tasting it on its own but you do get a real concentration to those to those fruit notes there um so that, that's why you're getting things like cassis and raisin coming through it's just so that what makes it the founders uh reserve it, they they it's not got the same sort of age that a lot of the sort of older ports has but what makes it special is that they picked some of their best fruit to put into it but delicious, really, really very pleasant. That indeed, very pleasant indeed. Um, um, and Kathy's been to Denby's, yeah, that's where the Wine GB uh, meeting was the other day as well. Um, very, it's a it's a cool place to visit. Now, I I, I wasn't the hugest fan of some of their wines, um, but they've also got this side project, haven't they? The Litmus. Mm. Which I I'm a big fan of a lot. They of make a uh, orange backers, a oh. white. They've made a white pinot yeah, noir white in the past, which is really cool. Stunning, very cool place to go, and it's beautiful. You can go on the wine train. So and we've we've got people, and we've got people ahead of the game for next week. Yeah, already, got their, talk, already got their, oh, already got their, already got fantastic. The already got their cheese ready to go. Excellent, so, excellent. So yeah, if you are diving in on that, Monday is last call for cheese. So Jess can get the okay. uh, the cheeses, but we'll pop everyone an email. So yeah, of course, once again, as always, if you love the wines. Oh, prices. Well, shall we, shall we, shall we move it wine on to the, the boat? Let's, the let's, let's, let's do one of the night and then we'll do prices. Night, which is hard because it's all about the pairings tonight. But let's see what people are saying. And, um, and yeah, I'll turn we've got a, we've, all the way to we've got a, story. we've got a, we've got a final chance for any last minute wine puns, any last minute wine puns and any classic final pairings, anything that you found fun, interesting that you think we've missed that you think would be a great pairing. And should we do more things like this? Should we have more food on the table? Should we make it a little bit more interactive, a little bit more, yeah. have it as a, rather than just me and Alex on talking about wine, do you want to do more of a wine tasting with pairings and things like that? Would that be more fun? Would that make it more of a night in for you guys? Let us know what you think. Yeah, because nights out seem to be getting more and more expensive and it's kind of ridiculous now, especially when you're like us and have to get babysitters in for things and taxis all involved and it starts getting quite ridiculous um let's have a look at how how it's doing um what one person still left putting their votes in a couple more doing their votes i'll let them keep going on should i pop the prices up now yeah pop the prices, pop up. The prices well, up well most people are in there so we've got so we've got quite quite a bit of variation a bit of variation yeah. some things of good value some <clears> things <throat> you know the giant steps i think is delicious pricey wine uh, but yeah. you compare it to Pinot Noir from Burgundy of a similar I, I quality. I think it offers a good value and for from, And from California and Oregon these days, because, well, even though those have just gone... And other places in uh, Australia, to be fair. True, true, indeed. So so lots of things available there. Um, and um, I'm going to obviously put up Jamie's very clever little link as well, which is not that one, it's that one. Um, so that will just take you straight to the thing. Uh, but of course, it's in your tasting guide as well. We've got some other... People saying uh, they've had a lovely time. Can't wait for next week. Um, really interesting cheese and wine combinations. Um, thank you all so much. Um, it's so been super fun. I'm going to make the claim. The Morbier pun was the best. I think so. So, so Amy, do you want to Amy, drop, drop drop us an email. Let us know which wine you liked. And then, you know, we'll get that out to you. If you want to order yeah, any other wines, absolutely. let us know. And we'll tag that all together and get it all out for Fantastic. you. But, I thought that was a bit of fun. We should do more fun. bits of we fun. We should like do that. more little bits of fun. But yeah. speaking of a bit of fun, wine of the night was. It was drum roll, drum roll. Well, what a surprise! It was the Pinot Noir. The Pinot Noir, closely followed by the port, which and is then great. and then the closely moment. followed by everything else. Yeah, everything else all right in my mind. Everyone loved the Pinot, and I think I agree that was that was stunning. But that is a very very good port as well. So thank you all for joining us. Um, for those of you who were around about a year and a half ago, you are probably not going to be a bit surprised by what we're about to subject you to. So. But Enjoy or Enjoy. turn off very quickly. No, but uh, thank you so much. Thank we'll see you all again see very you. soon. Good night. Cheers. Bye.
sweet dreams are made of cheese Who am I to disagree? A cheddar the world and a feta cheese Everybody's looking for Stilton Some cheese wants to be blue too Some cheese wants to be bouchette on you Some cheese wants to be cute some cheese will be cubed by you Sweet dreams are made of wine A glass of shabby would taste so fine Jammy red roux for Caroline Everybody's gotta have been now Some cheese ought to be grated No cheese should be ammoniated Some cheese will always be hated No cheese wants to be called rancid Sweet dreams are made of cheese Case and rennet, cuddle it with ease Way from the curds, it eventually freeze The best cheese is really too poor Sweet dreams are made of cheese Case and rennet, cuddle it with ease Way from the curds, it eventually freeze The best cheese is really